Good afternoon uh, to everyone. I am afraid that there was a problem here. So good afternoon to everyone. Um, uh, thank you very much for joining the, this webinar. Uh, and also would like to thank very much uh, Claire, Brian, Glenn and Jenny for this amazing initiative of the Life Stuff Talk. And also for this huge opportunity to be here and share with you some of the work that is being developed at BOM. So my name is Inez Martins and I'm currently doing my postdoc at the Structural Knowledge Divisions. And today I will talk about the use of NMR crystallography as a key piece to solve structural puzzles. And this will be mainly focused on drug multi-component solid forms. So why? multi-component drug forms or why are they important? So as probably most of you already know, launching new drugs in the market is cost intensive, takes between 10 to 15 years of research, and after those processes, 40% of the approved drugs have poor biopharmaceutical properties and 90% are too insoluble. So in order to overcome this problem and in order to improve the solubility and bioavailability properties, pharmaceutical industries is very much interesting on preparing new multi-component forms of the already approved drugs. And this includes co-crystals, coamorphous, salts, ionic liquids, and basically the difference between the two is the location of the labile proton. On co-crystals, we have two entities which are in the neutral state, with, which are also sharing an hydrogen bond interactions. Rather than on salts, we have an, an, an charted assisted hydrogen bond interactions. And the distinction between these two entities is highly demanded by the Food and Drug Administration guidelines. And in order to answer this question, where is the labile proton, we can use a tool called NMR crystallography. And basically, we can think about an, the NMR crystallography as a jigsaw puzzle. So we have our X-ray diffraction uh, data, where we can have uh, information about the atomic positions, distance, angles, packing interactions. We can also play with the solid state nuclear magnetic resonance because this technique is very sensitive to the nuclei and therefore we can locate the hydrogen atoms position using the technique. We can also study some packing interactions which together with the x-ray give us the overall uh, view about the 3D uh, packing structure. We can also uh, perform some density functional theory for geometry optimization and also for calculate the NMR parameters, which will be therefore compared with the data obtained from solid state NMR, and also will allow us to make the, signal, the, the assignment of all the signals from the NMR. And with all these three tools, we can fully characterize the crystalline materials. On the other hand, if you want to get a molecular level inside into amorphous materials, which is another topic that we are very much interested in here at BOM, especially on pharmaceutical systems, we can also combine the solid state NMR with another technique called pair distribution function. And basically this technique gives us the probability of finding two pairs of atoms at a certain distance, and therefore we extract information about both intra and intermolecular distance. And together with the solicit NMR, we can also try to build up models, run some molecular dynamic simulations, get the overall uh, uh, um, idea and information about the molecular arrangement, and also calculate the pair distribution function. And then we can compare the two Get the experimental one obtained from the technique. So with all these three techniques, we can fully characterize the amorphous materials. And in this talk, I will mainly focus on the crystalline materials. So before I show you the case study of today, I would like to show some of the previous work that I've been developed doing especially my PhD project. So I've been working with the azelaic acid. This drug is used to treat some skin disorders and possess some low solubility. And therefore we combine this molecule with different biocompatible co-formers in order to produce new multi-component drug forms. And here I am only interesting to show you one of the highlights of this uh, particular project, which is, here presented as the combination of the as like with the morpholine conformer. So here we have our NMR data, the proton one. So as you can see, we made the attributions of all the signals because we also use the density functional theory to help on that. And you see we have CH2 protons, we have the intermolecular interactions in this range. And what I want to highlight here is this particular chemical shift at 20.1, which is not very usual for this type of materials. And then when we did this density functional theories, we realize the disorder of this proton. So indeed this proton that is sitting here is located exactly in the middle of the interaction between these two carboxylic moieties, which, uh, which give us th this very sensitive 
with information of the location. So it's just to highlight the importance of the technique in this particular case. So another example is adamantylamine salt. So adamantylamine has been used to treat some neurological diseases. It possesses a very low solubility too, so the dissolution rate profile is also very low. And therefore, we combine the molecule with different biocompatible conformers. Here, I present here the, the the NMR data, the carbon NMR data, because I wanted to show you how we can uh, understand, for instance, the protonation of an amine group that is, uh, uh, inter that is connected by this quaternary carbon. So as you can see here, we have the chemical shift of our starting material, and we have the chemical shift of the same carbon, uh, of the molecule presence uh, when in the combination with the conformers. And as you can see, there is a shift towards higher field, which is an uh, indirect indication that the protonation state occur. We also did some nitrogen NMR um, evaluation. So here we have our data, and this data basically confirms the previous one. So we did the nitrogen uh, analysis. We see this chemical shift from the primary amine of the adamantylamine, and we see a shift toward higher field. So therefore, we have here um, an indication of the protonation of the primary amine. So now moving on to another example, which is gabapentin. So gabapentin also have these problems with the solubility and also problems with the bioavailability. So we combine the molecule with different conformers. And we have here the 2D NMR. So what I want to highlight in this particular case is this uh, a distinguishing, distinguishing of this proton, which is directly engaged on a nitrogen bond interaction. So you see it's this aliphatic proton H6. So if you look to the crystallographic structure and looking back also to the density functional uh, theory uh, calculations after the geometry optimization, you see we have here a CHO interaction of 2.8 angstroms. And this is the shielded with comparison, for instance, with the H7, which is not involved in an hydrogen bond interaction. So this gives us once more uh, a, an insight of all the sensitive on locating those protons. So we also have the interactions between uh, the carboxylic groups, so the OH uh, interactions with the oxygen of the methanol sulfonate, and we also have those interactions of the protonated primary amine with the methanol sulfonate molecules. So now moving to the example that I wanted to show you today, which is the salicylic acid. This molecule is an anti-inflammatory drug, and it also has a very low solubility and dissolution rate profile. And therefore, in this study, we combine salicylic acid with different conformers. In this case, they are imidazolium-based conformers. And we use them particularly because they have been used on the literature for, uh, in the combination with different APIs in order to improve those specific properties. And therefore, we did it exactly the same with this system. And we prepared these by mechanochemistry. So basically, we took together our API with each of different conformers. We ground our material under neat grinding conditions, so basically in the absence of solvent. And then we obtained new crystalline forms. Those crystalline forms, uh, we try to get single crystals because, as you know, it's a, a routine technique and very easier to get access to and then obtain the crystal graphic structure of the materials. But in those particular cases, growing the single crystals was not possible, and therefore we recurve to a different uh, approach. So you use the powder X-ray diffraction data to get information of our crystal graphic structures. So here I basically present the step-by-step, -step, just in a very general way, of what we can do in order to obtain our crystallographic structures. So we first start with the indexation process. So basically we determine the spacey group and the cell contents. We can do this using, for instance, Topaz, Dash, Fox programs. We can do the poly refinement after that. So basically we want to see if our cell parameters determined first were, are correct or not. And then we can move for the structure solution using, for instance, the simulated annealing algorithm. This is very routinely implemented on Dash and Fox programs. So after this, we evaluate all the results. We select a set of possible structures based on this figure of merit, which is another statistical parameter that tells us how good the model is with comparison with experimental data that we have. And then we select the best structure. We refine the positions, the angles and distance restraints using the ritual refinement method. And then we obtain our final model. So in order to locate the hydrogen atoms, then we are recurring to the solid state nuclear magnetic resonance and density functional theory. 
So moving to the first example and showing the results of the first one. So we have the salicylic acid combined with the mesozolium uh, co-former. Here we have the retrol refinement plot. As you can see here on gray, we have the difference curves which, that tells us how good the, the fitting is. So in the comparison with the experimental and theoretical powder patterns, and you see it's quite good, the fitting. These also can be seen by these statistical values, the R values, and you see that we have an uh, orthorhombic unit cell. So looking to the crystal structure, we have this kind of zigzag interaction. They are composed by these two molecules. We have salicylic acid and imidazolium imid molecule. And in fact, we need to understand if this proton is sitting here or is sitting in the nitrogen position. And therefore we need to move on to the DFT and solicitin MR. That's what we did in fact. So we calculate we did some geometry optimization of our structures using the quantum expressor calculations. Then we optimize the structure and then we have here a superposition between both optimized and non-optimized. The non-optimized one came directly from the simulated annealing process. And as you can see, the positions are quite well, the distance and the angles are also very well. But if you look on details into the inter intermolecular interactions, you can see that actually the proton initial located on the carboxylic group migrates to this uh, nitrogen uh, um, element. So we have this NHO interaction. So in order to fully characterize this and understand if this is really the correct structure, which is in principle it is because it's an indication from our um, geometry optimization, then we need to, to use the solid state nuclear magnetic resonance. But before going into that, I would like to show you how it looks, the packing structures of all these materials. So we have here imidazolium rings sitting in between. We have NHO interactions, which are the strong interactions. We have the CHO interactions too, so the weak interactions, also with the CH pi interactions. So our molecule is surrounded by different salicylic acid molecules. So by looking to the packing in a different perspective, we have these two types of cross layers. And then we have here a channel composed by these pi pi stacking interactions. Now looking to the other two uh, examples of the two compounds with the one methylimidazolium and two methylimidazolium, we also did the same approach. So we solved by powder X-ray diffraction uh, uh, data. Uh, we also obtain here um, our, we perform our geometry optimization using the density functional theory. We superpose these with this, the simulated annealing one. And as you can see, we have the same behavior. We have a transference of this hydrogen atom. So the packing structures now are a little bit different. For instance, for this one with the one methyl imidazolium, we have our metic group blocking one of the nitrogen positions, and therefore this position is not anymore involved on hydrogen bond interactions. And that's why we have this kind of a sandwich packing structure. So moving to this, the, the, the two methyl imidazolium one, so here you can see that we have a kind of zigzag packing structure. And in this case, we have these CH pi interactions between the imidazolium molecules. So now that we have access to all the structures in terms of, um, uh, of X-ray diffraction, so we have access to the 3D structure, we optimize the structure, we need to move now to the solid state NMR data. And before I show you some of the results, I would like to introduce a bit on the technique. So there are several types of interactions. We have the Zeeman interaction, which, which, one, which is one of the most important interactions on NMR. So basically, this describes the interactions between a spin nuclei and the external magnetic field given by B0. And physically speaking, this can be described as a Hamiltonian operator, where we, where we have our geomagnetic constants that basically tells us how much a nucleo is magnetic. And then we can uh, combine these with the angular momentum vector inherent to the spin nuclei. And then we have also our external magnetic field as a vector to indicate the direction of, of the external magnetic field. So we also have the dipole-dipole interaction. So it's the direct interaction between two spin nuclei here represented. And then the Hamiltonian expression is basically the product between these two angular momentum vectors. And then in between we have a tensor, which is that dipole-dipole tensor. Basically tensor brings together two vectors. So that's one of, one of the most important things on NMR2. So we also have the G-coupling interactions. So we have the interactions between two spin nuclei through the electrons. And also the Hamiltonian expression is very similar to the previous one. But then we have here a tensor which is called the G-coupling tensor. 
We also have the chemical shift interaction, which is one of the most important ones. So basically give us our spectra with the different signals, with the different chemical shifts, and that's, that's therefore we attribute our protons and our nucleus position based on that. This is a very important interaction, and it's the interaction between our spin nuclei with the external magnetic field through the electrons. And then the Hamiltonian expression, it also counts with the geomagnetic constant, with the angular momentum, with the tensor, which is the chemical shielding tensor, and with external magnetic field vector. So in this presentation, I will focus on the chemical shift because it's very important, as I mentioned before, for these attributions. And also because these particular interactions along with the dipole-dipole interactions are very much involved in the phenomena called anisotropy. So basically what I wanted to say is that when we have solids, we don't have our molecules in movement. And this type of interactions very much depends on the position of the molecules. And therefore, we have an effect called anisotropy. So we have, diff we have this kind of envelope, which gives us the average uh, of all possible positions of each of nuclei uh, with interaction with the external magnetic field. If you look to the liquids, this effect is not present because all the molecules are tumbling very fast. Therefore, all the interactions do not depend on the molecular orientation. They are coming into an average, so it comes to zero, and then we have here our signals very sharp. So let's try to uh, understand a bit more on the anisotropy and how this can affect the chemical shift. So let's imagine the following. I'm not going here into the details of the physics and all the equations, but I wanted to show you a little bit how this works. So let's imagine the following. We have the crystal or a tiny crystal in our powder sample, and then we, it's composed by several molecules that are packing in a different way. So let's imagine that we have one single molecule with one single orientation. So this orientation can be described by this tensor that is perpendicular to the plane of the molecule. And when this, this crystal or this sample is placed into the external magnetic field, the position of the tensor can vary, and vary according with this beta angle with respect to the external magnetic field. And this can be given by this expression here, the Hamiltonian expression, as I demonstrated before. And what I want to catch the attention is these uh, um, values here in between the equation, which basically gives us the variation of chemical shielding as a function of beta. Let's try to understand this a bit more. So let's imagine we have here this graphical representation. Let's think that we have our tensor parallel to be zero. So beta will be equal to zero. And if you substitute on the equation, this term comes into one, this term comes into zero, and then we have sigma zeta zeta. And because the tensor is parallel to the chemical, uh, to the external magnetic field, then the effect is a, sh that is a shielding effect, it, which means that the values comes to higher uh, um, uh, field. It, on the other hand, if we think about the beta equal to 90 degrees, our tensor is perpendicular to the external magnetic field. This term comes to zero, this term comes to one, and then we have sigma xx. And because it's perpendicular, the effect is not so strong as the one in parallel. Therefore, we have a shift towards uh, lower values of sigma. So if you think about the variation of beta, it's like a sigmoidal curve. So we have zero, 90 degrees, zero, 90 degrees. And our isotropic value should sit somewhere in between these two values. So now let's think about our sample. So by, composed by different crystallites. And let's imagine the static conditions. There is no movement on the molecules. Our average of the anisotropic positions of this tensor with respect to the B0 will be something like this where we have here the tensor perpendicular to B0 and our tensor parallel to B0 here. And then in between, we have all the possible variations. This is called the anisotropy. So now think, this is only for one type of orientation. So imagine several type of orientations, molecules are packing in different way. We have those type of envelopes. So in order to suppress those anisotropic effects, there is a, a technique called magic angle spinning that basically consists on introducing some artificial molecular movement to our sample. So let's see how it works. So we have here our rotor that contains our sample. 
its fill. And then we have our tensor here represented. So we have an angle between our tensor and also our principal axis, or spin axis of the router, that is called beta. And if you place our router as a precise angle of 54.7 degrees with respect to the external magnetic field, this term, which is very much involved on dipole-dipole interactions and chemical shift, comes into zero, and therefore we suppress this anisotropy. But this is not so simple as it seems. We also need to account with the frequency of spinning. So the frequency of spinning should be larger as the spectrum width, which, we, which should be faster than the amplitude of those type of interactions. So let's think now how it evolves during the frequency spinning. So we have here our envelope. As we start to spinning, we still have the envelope, but now we have very sharp lines. Those sharper lines are the spinning side bands of the spinning, the rotor spinning. And then if you increase this frequency, you see that the number of lines decreases and also the space in between increases. And therefore, after a certain point, after, this, after a certain frequency applied, we can have our isotropic value, which is indeed the value that we want. So now let's move on to the results itself for this particular case study. And I'm only showing the example with the salicy salicylic acid with one methylimidazole. This was performed for the other two samples as well. So what we did was to calculate the isotropical chemical shieldings. We did this using density functional theory. And then we can plot those theoretical values against the experimental values. And then we have this curve like this. And also this value gives us the correlation between the two. If this value is close to one, then we have a good correlation, which is also an indication that our structure is correct. So we did this for proton, we also did for carbon, and as you can see, the correlation is near one, which is a, a very good correlation. If you look to the proton now, this spectra is not so good, not so good in terms of resolution, and this is because the spinning rate was not so fast. It's only 10 kilohertz. Therefore, the resolution it was not so uh, good, but indeed, with the help with the DFT calculations, we could attribute all the signals. And you can see here the OHO interactions, ENHO interactions. And what I wanted to catch your attention is for this particular interaction. It's a weak interaction, a CH pi interaction, that appears here at a higher field. And this happened because this proton is directly pointing into this shielding cone of this ring current that we know from the NMR uh, theory. So therefore, this proton feels more this shielding effect and shifts towards higher field. That's what we have here. And also, because we want to make a direct comparison, if you want to make a direct comparison between all these uh, signals and the shifts, the chemical shift of these signals experimentally obtained by the data, with the theoretical one, we employ this, uh, um, this equation, which basically we can substitute the isotropic chemical shieldings coming out from the DFT, subtract from the reference which came out, coming out from these specific values, and then divide by the cleave of the equation, and then we have this uh, isotropic chemical shift value. And this is what we did. Here is just a table to show you, uh, to try to compare the two values. As you can see, they are very much close to each other. And also the root mean square deviation values are in accordance, which is a good indication of our uh, model is uh, correct. We also did for carbon. Again, we have the same situation. So we compare all these values and also the RMS, RMSD is quite good. And now that we fully characterize all the materials, so we have our salts, we could prove that because we did this correlation between theoretical and, and experimental values. We need now to evaluate the dissolution rate properties, which is one of our, of our main goals. And that's what we did. We did, in this case, starting with the salicylic acid, we see the curve, which is uh, the dissolution rate profile is very low. And if you combine salicylic with imidazolium, this dissolution rate profile increases, which, uh, which the sample dissolves more faster in water. For the other compound with one methyl imidazolium, we also have a similar profile as you can see here. And for the other one with the two methyl imidazolium, we also have a very huge improvement of this dissolution rate profile, but you see the curves are not so similar as the first one. And one reason why could be the type of packing interaction present in our material. In this case, we have this kind of channels in these two cases, and basically the water can probably float more easily through those channels and then accelerating the dissolution rate uh, profile. 
We also did the evaluation of, of the solubility, and here we have only the relative values. As you can see, all of them has a uh, higher solubility than the parent um, drug. And this salicylic acid with one methyl imidazole presents the higher solubility profile. So now I've been speaking about NMR crystallography in the context of pharmaceutical compounds, but this technique and this approach can actually be implemented in different fields. For instance, myomineralization in bone, inorganic materials, polymers, proteins for fully characterizing the material itself and try to drive some structure property relationship studies. So to finishing my presentation, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Francisca Emerling for this huge opportunity to work with her in our group and also for all the support for developing the NMR crystallography uh, approach uh, and also try to study all these very interesting uh, systems. I would like also to thank Dr. Werner Krauss for the fruitful scientific discussions, Dominic for helping on preparing and, and preparing all the compounds and collecting the data, Professor Gudrun from Humboldt University for for collecting the NMR data. Also, Dr. Michael Maiva, Dr. Klaus Meyer for doing the dissolution rate studies. Dr. Anna Bellingar for all the support for uh, friendship, for the scientific discussion. She is now a guest scientist at BOMB during six months. And I would also like to thank my supervisors for my PhD. So Professor Maria Teresa Duarte from University of Lisbon and Dr. Luis Maffer from University of Aveiro. I would like also to thank all my colleagues for all the support and all the scientific discussions that we had together. I would like to thank BAM for financial support my postdoc position. And I would also like to thank you very much for all your kind attention.